I mean, you know, there's there's a there's an idea that all rappers should be really technically gifted, and and when they move over a rhythm, you got to be strict, hit every beat. You know, mm. every syllable has to be meticulous. Mm. But there's there's much more. Like you look at artists like Kendrick Lamar, who's mm. opened the door for this again. But then you got artists like Mike, sometimes Navy Blue. Uh, there's there's a bunch of them, Marvy. Uh, there's others, and and at times they will. It's almost a deliberate thing that they'll non-align with the beat. They'll mm. kind of go out of flow of the beat. Mm. And sometimes, you know, people have to start realizing that that isn't a, a, side, a sign that those MCs are whack. Mm. Like it isn't a sign that they're not technically <clears throat> adept. What they're doing is they are putting, they are putting feelings mm. and that I, ideas and emotions over technical ability. Killer, killer, oh, 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 podcast. Killer, killer, official <laughs> Culture TV. Killer Killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Killer podcast. That's the things you learn, you know. Yeah, I guess it is a learning process. It's a learning curve, isn't it? Every time, yeah. Yeah. Hey, let's get into it. Wow. Yes. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or as central as you need to be. Choose to be. God done it. You don't want to be anywhere else. It'd be criminal. Plus, you can't afford it. Um, energy prices and all that. Get yourselves ready for the upcoming Hoddle Wars. It's time to graph punks up and get up with some NFT gaming. Also, big shout out to Chief Rocker Gear. From streets to stage, Chief Rocker is the streetwear of champions. Uh, anyway, look, big shout out to all the sharers and carers, people that are involved, moving and shaking and passing, see the knowledge which is the podcast. Subscribe, do the thing, and if you want more of the thing, go to the Kellervision app. Free download, iPhone, Android, for all your sporting art, street culture, bits and bobs. We are talking MC. We are dealing with a scientist, a wordsmith. The MC's MC, you know what I mean? We're going deep into this one like never before. If there's one person I know personally that embodies ultimately what MCing is about, it's this man here, hidden in the darkness, coming to light right now, Cannon's the EP, and we have Nottingham's finest capo in the place. Ooh. What's good, Keller? How you doing? Thank brother. you for the introduction. <laughs> Come on, we're out here, we're out here. Travel down as well. Yes, yeah, in the torrential rain. Hazardous. Signals of climate change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hazardous. Yeah, it was. It it was all right. It was all right. You know, um, it looks hazardous, but yeah, it's amazing how secure you can feel when you're in a metal box f- <laughs> surrounded by glass, traveling yeah. at ninety miles an hour. It's amazing how you yeah, can yeah. just switch lanes without in in torrential yeah. rain without yeah. really caring Absolutely. about the consequences. Fuck that. Like aquaplaning all the way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did see a car flipped on its roof as well. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there was somebody stood next to it mm. on their phone. Scratching their head. Yeah. And I, I, they had the, the ambulance was there, but it looked like it, it, I, I made up the story in my head that that was the survivor. They'd crawled out yeah, yeah, yeah. and just phoned their mum or something and like, Mum, I'm still coming home for Christmas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine that as the Christmas gift. Like, I'm I survived. Christmas. Yeah, yeah, I survived. <laughs> I survived. Christmas 2023. Yeah. Like, oh. Aquaplaning home for Christmas. Aquaplaning. Like, see what I'm saying? Like, lyricism. Um, one of the most humblest and sweetest humans, but an absolute fucking beast when it comes to word creating rap. Like, mm. it's... Bonker. I, I I put you in the higher echelon. I'm just saying. I put you in the higher echelon as from seeing you as a youngster. We used to, rock, you know, whenever we're going to Nottingham, check Capo. Whenever we're out on tour. Who is it we were with? We were El Fudge, wasn't it? In, El Fudge in Portugal. In Portugal. Yeah. <laughs> good days. Good days. Good days, days yeah. you know. But you've always been on it like that. You've always been. It's almost like leave Capo alone. Let him get on it over there and he'll just deliver fucking bars. That's yeah. you. That's yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. It's like a sport. Yeah, I, I, I think nowadays it's much more clear to me in the past decade that writing rhymes or that art form of writing is like a, is like a cathartic process. It's medicinal. Like, mm. and I talk about that on Canon quite a lot. The new LP. I talk about the fact that it's. Music is is a, is a form of escapism for a lot of people, but I I can notice, especially in the last decade, I notice when I've had a break from writing. You know when life gets in the way mm. of your art form, mm. and you have 
maybe a week or two and you think, okay, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the writing on the back burner. You've got family obligations, you've got work obligations, you've got other financial obligations. And then a couple of weeks in, I start to notice that my, I have a negative mind state. Like there's a the shroud, like the cloud starts to lower. And then you get three or four weeks in. Like I think I'm about three or four weeks in now. And I can just tell as a human being, I'm just becoming erratic, negative, you know. And it's because I don't have that half an hour. I don't allocate that half an hour in my day to write. If I write, then, you know, I, if I write, I don't, I don't necessarily find a map out of uh, elements of mental health decline. But if I write, just something implicit, something happens. I lock in, I'm able to say a word that links with my soul or whatever, mm -hmm. and then I just feel better. You know, mm -hmm. it's a cathartic process. You walk, I walk out of my outhouse where I write or the studio, and I just feel better. Sometimes, you know, the music never comes to light, mm -hmm. but it's a process I have to go through. You know, whether it's successful or not, it's a process I have to go through. I think that's something, first of all, so many, so much to take away from that. But as, um, as somebody that enjoys the sport, but also sees it as, a, like you say, a medicinal, it's, it's therapy, it's a form yeah, of... Yeah, it's definitely therapy, yeah. yeah. Dude, that's, that, isn't that, that's every MC's dream, to be totally obsessed, fully, fully engaged yeah. with the art. Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah... yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. That's incredible. Yeah. Okay, so let's break it down. And, you know, I'm going to jump straight to it because I want to know the day in the life of Kappa. Because if, we, if we're talking about the day in the life of a lyricist, we're getting into this. Right, so what? tell me your, how, how's your, how's your day structured? Well, I was talking to somebody about this recently about, because when you asked me about a day in the life, all of a sudden I had those millisecond thoughts about giving things away you know like giving insights away that may weaken my resolve oh tomorrow. i love it i fucking i love i love what I'm, this is a military mind step yeah. right here well there's uh, there's an author called ernest hemingway and he he said don't don't speak too much about the writing process you know he's a, he yeah, that's a right super prominent writer in the modernist theory in the early 1900s or you know 1920s mm. but he said something a lot like it really stuck with me he said this line i was telling somebody recently and he said don't talk about the art process too much because what you do as a writer, you'll take away the pattern of the feathers on a hawk's wing or you'll take away the pollen from a butterfly's wings. It's that detail. You take away the sheen off the top oh. if you talk about it too much. So I'm afraid to talk yeah. about my... Like the ozone layer having like a crack in it or a hole in it. It's like, it's just, yeah. it's, 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 um, uh, it's easier for people to... Get, get through your your um your yeah um, yeah yeah maybe yeah or yeah it's easier to get through the shield and to work somebody out if you want to be have an element of mystique but the other thing is i think what he was getting at is that when you start talking about it too much you don't do it mm -hmm. and the next time you go back to it it's like oh like you're writing from another perspective whereas if you don't talk about it just get on with it which mm -hmm. is maybe mm -hmm. why there's that assumption that I'm really prolific maybe you know mm. that I write and write and write and it like you were saying at the beginning like just let him get on with it yeah that type of thing is more than likely because I'm a little bit afraid of giving away what is important to me you but know do you know how rare that is that some because you know you've you've sustained a hearty career you know only in the MC lane give or take but I'm pretty mm. A couple of collaborations, a bunch of collabs. I, I, I remember. Um, Hold tight, heavy Bronx. Actually, yeah, that's that. Yeah. They're that was, bad boys. Yeah. That was yeah, sick. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Where I'm going? Yeah, it's just that you have managed to carve out this career, and in the shadows, I don't think it's that. It's that you've you've stayed absolutely true to your core and what your principles are mm. for MCing, and I get the feeling that. Your the the competition you, you know, you have the invisible competitor in your mind, mm. which is most likely you. It's probably yeah, not, but it, but definitely. you 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 do you you do measure up, and I, I guess there's an expectation that all MCs should be like that in your mind. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, I think nowadays, especially, you know, MCs have uh, obligation to be personalities. You know, mm. from my era, I think it it my era and the previous era, maybe two generations before me, it was. The emphasis was on lyricism and 
mm. the craft of being an MC. You know, mm. from Rakim onwards, I, I'm, I, mm. you know, I assume, up until maybe early millennia, mm. early millennium when, you know, social media really started taking a hold, and then there there was much more of a responsibility to be an all round personality, mm. to have other strings to your bow, so to speak. Mm. You know, I, I think it's to my detriment that I that I concentrate on just the MCing. Why? Um, well, it depends on what you think is, is detriment or is, is a negative element of your career. But yeah, I think, I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't say it's negative. It's just, that it's, it's the thing that I do. It's my lane. And like I say, it's medicinal for me or it's therapeutic for mm. me. So it's what I have to do. And if I, I've, I've come to terms with that and that, that, that's, that makes it okay that I haven't made you know, monetary success where I can sit back and think, okay, where do I go with my legacy now? I'm still chasing that, mm. that financial legacy. You know what I mean? I'm still, I think, I think a problem that a lot of artists have, you know, wholesome artists, I think that's the wrong word to say wholesome, but artists who put the art first and foremost to mm. the f forefront, sometimes they do that to their detriment, I think, mm. you know, so they don't worry of the, it, the, uh, elements of music and law and business behind music is an afterthought. Mm. You know, what what you want to do, what you prioritise is the music first. Mm. So you make sure that that is as, as high up in, in your estimations or your perfectionist mind state as possible. But then, and then you release it, mm. but then you don't take care of everything that's in the background. There's so much, mm. like, in the background of music business and, you know, all of those organizations and corporations that you have to adhere to. Um, and you can easily like there's there's no there's not really anybody telling you. There was not anybody telling me, look, you need to get your business covered. Mm -hmm. Like you, pe people have always said, you know, I've, I've minded my craft and I've been, you know, up there with my skill set. And, I, you know, I, I like to release products that have longevity, hopefully, mm -hmm. and, you know, that that sound good. But nobody really was pushing me. Not that I'm blaming or moaning anybody, but nobody was there saying you need to get your business covered because mm. in in 20 years' time, what's your legacy going to look like? Do you know what I mean? I'm thankful that after 20, 25 years of releasing music, um, that I'm still able to do it because mm. I know that there's others who are just as much perfectionists as me, just as much uh, craftspeople of mm. this art form who aren't able to do it anymore because mm. life has got in the way, you know, and, and yeah. they weren't able to negotiate the business. Mm. They weren't lucky enough to be able to negotiate the business. The business is, you know, it's, it's a complex thing. And I, and I, and I think it's almost, what would it be? It would, in, in language terms, it would be an oxymoron, like artist and business person. Mm. There's only people like Jay Z, mm. you know, but mm. there's many people who are artists and business people, but, you know, in the, in that lane, there's, it's I think it's quite rare to be able to be successful in both camps. Yeah, you're right. In ex t taking Jay Z as a case in point, do you feel, you know, not that you want to critique the, these levels, but mm. you're obviously you'll hear certain things in tracks like for someone like Jay Z. Can you hear? Can you hear a lack of anything because he split? his head between business and, for instance, and mm. I, I, I picked Jay-Z through what you said because, you know, the, 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 the mythology of Jay-Z is he walks in and he just freestyles his way through a track and then he walks out mm. and then learns it later for live or whatever. Yeah. Like, can you hear that where he's not putting a hell of a lot of devotion to the, the craft itself? Yeah, I think so, yeah. With somebody like that, I put him up there as, as if, you know, one of, if not the greatest rapper MC of all time because mm. of that yeah. because of what you're saying you know that effortlessness the truthfulness the honesty mm. the delivery is is uh yeah it's changed over time patterns and flows have changed over time mm. but you you always know it's him and there's i think for some early on in their career they can put on they can put on airs and graces like I've done it. You know, mm. you put a, an American twang on your voice, or you put an you put effort in to try mm. and shape your voice too much, and then every time that you step to the microphone, it's not you mm. genuinely you speaking mm -hmm. through the words. And I think you know, it's taken me twenty years to to be able to do that. You yeah. know, to look myself in the mirror and think, you know what, like what you need to be able to do is when you when you speak on the microphone, you need to be able to say the things you need to say like you would do off the mic, you know. Mm. But then again, that's that's 
that's contradictory as well because you look at somebody like Annie Lennox from Eurythmics. You, you know, she speaks yeah. in a, a, a heavy, I think it's Glaswegian or yeah. a, a Scottish yeah, accent yeah, when yeah. she speaks, but then when she's on when she's on stage, she's got this beautiful, elegant, oh, yeah. eloquent singing voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's under, in some ways that's understandable because this that that's not again not that I'm equating myself to somebody like that, but I understand now after 25 years of of doing this thing that what can happen to you if you have a, a broad accent mm. like england is all about class mm. you know and as soon as somebody has a has embraced or has a strong accent mm. especially from the north mm. people make those assumptions like oh this this guy's from the gritty up north mm. you know so you, and then and then a lot of artists they have to play that lane they no, they might not necessarily feel like they or want to, but because yeah. of their the the, the vocal yeah, the perception in the way, yes. of people oh, who hear it, okay. it's like oh well, they hear that accent. That's the class they're from. Mm. They have to play the working class person from the Midlands. They have to play that role, which is you know I I get it, but somebody like Annie Lennox, did she early on was she told or did she herself individually think you know what I am going to narrow my prospects of mm. having a Having a global career, if I sing in a mm. in a Glaswegian accent, it's true. Yeah, am I gonna am I gonna regionalize myself? You regionalize yourself, and then uh, at some points, uh, you know, in some ways that's of benefit. Yeah. In other ways, you can't escape that. No. You, you you know, I say in a, in a in a recent lyric like product of the place I was born. There's no escaping. Hear mm. it in my voice and tell it from the way I speak. Yeah. You know, it's it's and yeah. and when you when you realize that, it took me a long time. Like, I'm 44. It took me till 44 to realise that what I've been chasing is that regional thing. Yeah. And now I, I want to break out of that, but, you you know... I, I have to... Right, so there's a couple of things that we can dissect off from that. The, this whole statement is, is, is a treasure trove of conversation. Right, so first of all, you mentioned Flo. Uh, Flo from Jay-Z. Now, mm. um, we, uh, he's certainly one of a, a character that people, you can hear... It, as soon as someone opens their mouth, who they're influenced by, right? There was this period of DMX where all of a sudden everyone was sounding a bit DMX y. Mm. I remember when Talib Kweli came out and everyone started copying their, his flow, mm. his pattern, his word pattern. And more recently, Kendrick Lamar, people copying that pattern. Dank, dank, de dank, de dank, 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 you know, mm. real simplified stuff. Um, and with you and, and, and Nottingham, you've got, there's a, tone, a tonality to. The, the delivery of the lyrics, that it just fits. In my humblest opinion, I've said it from the jump, Nottingham has a better accent for rapping. It just does. It does. And, yeah. and you can hate me, London, because I love you all. <laughs> it's the truth. I, I've always had a feeling. It, it's the way that you guys roll your, the, the words. And mm. it, it, it's, you, can, you can afford to say class, mm. Because and that from even from an American standpoint is the same ah, as yeah people, it as is yeah it use. might have links with that yeah yeah it like has although it do it does sound distinctly different from an American accent but yeah you know some somebody from America will say class like like us whereas if you're from London maybe you say class yeah yeah you know what I'm saying yeah it's true so that's why I've always had this yo like Nottingham it's just a oh, hotbed of just yeah skills and yeah. I have said in the past about the Nottingham accent and how I've relied on an accent quite heavily because there's there's times when like you were talking about flows, how people inherit flows. Mm. Like I did, I recently did a PhD in that uh, area. PhD, you know? Yeah, I did. PhD. I, I un undertook a thesis that was based. The chapter chapter three was based around this idea of lyrical performative quotation. It looked into Kendrick Lamar, and. Although it didn't talk about this, like taking flows from each other, it, it talked about he's got a track. Um, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Get but in, it. yeah, get he's, in. He's go. He 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 has a track called "Good Kid, Mad City," and a, and as as part of that track, when he first starts to speak as this character within the track, he has this wavering kind of tremulous tone of voice, almost in a way to try and project this idea of PTSD of what is the struggle or what circumstance this character is in it evokes that and after that in the in the in the two years afterwards there were several artists emerging artists who undertook that like they perform they performatively quoted that 
quavering voice in mm. order to evoke that same sense of trauma or that same sense of post-traumatic stress disorder in that way. But what, what I'm... So that's a lyrical performative quotation. So, you know, I have an understanding of how MCs borrow from each other. Yeah, there's, there's, it's deeply inherent in, mm -hmm. in hip hop culture. Mm -hmm. to, it's, it's innate, that it's an open source culture that you give and you take, you know, you take quotes and you get you gain power from other people's quotes and they take yours, you know. Oh, open and, source, bro. And, yeah. and a cheap to enter one at that, like you yes. better be fucking good, man. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I You're going to take, you know what I mean? Yeah. Pattern up. Yes, yeah, but the the other thing that I think I've, I think I've relied on quite heavily, over my career is that yeah I think all MCs they they borrow from each other, pay homage, and yeah flows I think are important. You know, there's <coughs> artists like Nas, Kendrick Lamar, mm. like like all of those artists that you're talking about. At some point they were so prominent that most artists took notice and and started to mm. in, 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 envelop that into their practice. But I think. One thing that you can do is you, if you've got a broad accent or you can rely on that accent to cover up the edges of how much you're taking. That's right. So, for instance, what, 10, 15 years ago it must have been, Rick Ross came in and he had this almost a, what I would deem as a new type of flow where he'd leave a lot of gaps. Mm. You know, the, the, the sentences would be complex, but then you'd have a gap to, to almost process what he was saying. And then he'd, you know, that big breathing space, then he'd elaborate yeah. going further. And I took that on. I, I like that flow, so I took it on. But I did it with res I tried to do it with, with respect. But another element that masks that whole imitation and adaptation and revision process is, is when you put the accent on, mm. it takes away that direct link. Mm. You know, because there's there's no I don't I don't have the same accent as him. Maybe if I had the same accent, I tried to take directly mm. from his. Do you know what mm. I mean? It would be more than homage. It would be imitation, and then you start getting into mm. muddy waters. Influence is, is a real yeah. tightrope of a walk, isn't it? Yeah, it is, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that there are there are ways you can do that with respect. I think, you know, the whole hip-hop culture, b-boying and graffiti, all of the art forms, I think you can take influence, but it's almost as if you have to implicitly pay your respects at the same time, but then also put your own spin on it, mm. you know? So I, I came up with a... It's a poorly developed term or concept for that process, which I'd say is study, imitate, recreate, then master. So first of all, you're passionate, you obsess over somebody's flow, say, or, mm. or you obsess over somebody's dance patterns if you're a b-boy. Mm. Then you imitate, you know, naively just try and imitate mm. and uh, try, to, try to reach a point where you feel like you're on a level with them and having an understanding of the angles that they may be pushing mm. or, or, you know, the angles that they may be stopping at whilst they're moving. Then you then you put your own spin on it. Then you start to recreate it in your own image. Mm. You know, find find something that makes it distinctly yours as well as theirs. And then you master it. You know, that's when the final product is there, and you and then you can show it to the world because it's like right, I've done enough now that I'm not just imitating. You know, I'm being influenced, but I'm showing the develop. I'm I'm pushing it further. Mm. I think that's what hip hop culture's always done. That's what the competitive element is. It's pushing things further. You know, that's I'm going to a master here. <laughs> Fucking loving this. I was just like, yeah, I'll just keep this thing recording, fam. <laughs> yeah, it's really incredible. Finally, get a chance to talk to Kappa. Crazy. All right, so who do you obsess with? I mean, you talk about obsessiveness and emceeing. Um, who have you, uh, without giving too much away, because we don't want that to in any way be, you know, detrimental to, yeah, your influence of that person. But who recently have you as a case study just sat there and done nothing but listen to them I, I was lucky enough during the PhD process to be able to study Nas mm. uh, Kendrick Lamar mm. and and uh, Earl Sweatshirt emerging artists like Mike and Navy Blue and how they mm. you know one of the, the themes that, that leads throughout the, the doctorate or the thesis the critical chapters of the thesis is how they use certain literary techniques or, you know, performative techniques in order to articulate trauma. You know, uh, Naz is the early, one of the early examples that I talk about. You know, he's, he, Naz is from, like, 94. Mm. You know, that's a long time ago now. Mm. And uh, at that point in rap music in particular, it was hyper-masculine, you know. Mm. So speaking about your vulnerabilities, you have to do it uh, short and sharp. 
Like everything else has to prove like your exterior, that hard exterior. But every now and again, you give you give the listener, the the proactive listener, you give them a glimpse into your mm. makeup. Mm. Whereas somebody like Lamar steps in, mm. and they are able to perform under these different cadences and these di different levels of, of performative quotation to a point where they're taking on female characters. They're taking on other characters in their neighborhoods. They're mm -hmm. taking on brothers and sisters or, and it's, and it's, not, a, a, it's not a form of imitation, you know, or it's not an impression. These mm. things seem realistic. Mm. And, and that's how he, I think, is one of the ways in which he was able to talk about uh, elements of vulnerability within his community or as a, as a rap artist talk about his own uh, personal vulnerabilities without fear or shame of, of being retaliated against in the culture that he's speaking for and from. So he really opened the door. You know, mm. Lamar is somebody that I've obsessed over before the PhD mm. process, but just being able to see how he has revised the game, mm. you know, especially West Coast rap, yeah. just revised it, you know, addressed problematic tropes or addressed traditions and made people rethink how what they were celebrating previously you know oh, I, I used to celebrate that element of the music now Lamar's kind of made me rethink it like what if I really was involved in that how would I really feel you know that's mm. uh, that's that's groundbreaking you know and you hear some like in academia you hear some people saying that, that Lamar is, is problematic in his own ways but I always have to rep him because of how how groundbreaking he you know the amount that he's done artistically, I think it's unrivaled. It's mm. unprecedented, mm -hmm. you know. Do you, do you um do you think that the Joe public uh, do 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 they do you think they subconsciously connect to that that quality of Kendrick? Did you think they under do you think they know what they're actually dialed into and love about it? Do they think that deep? You think? Um, I think. Yeah, it's a dangerous game to play, isn't it? When mm. you're an artist of yeah. that high grade, yeah. I think you you probably have to play both. Play it down both, slightly. Yeah, yeah, you probably have to play both ends of the scale. So your label is saying, "Where's the single?" Yeah, but you've made this deeply complex piece of high mm. high culture, mm. and you're then you're pushing like, okay, well, we need to push for a single. But even in the singles of you know the recent album, Mr. Morale, the singles they contain profound. Uh, lyrics. There's, yeah. there's. I mean, it, you know, look at the beginning of his studio album career, like uh, uh, a breakout single like Swimming Pools. Mm. Swimming Pools was deep. Like it spoke about yeah. alcoholism or drug addiction in the community and in, and in the family mm. circles that he he was from. Yeah. And and but the thing is, like you can equate somebody like Lamar to Shakespeare, mm. which is a you know it's a big leap and it's also uh, it's also a rubbish link because you know somebody like uh, Shakespeare is. Mm out the picture in, in comparison to modern day. But, you know, somebody still who is lauded as being important and championed on the literary circuit. But you can you can equate somebody like Lamar because of what he does on something like swimming pools is he subverts meaning. So for, for, for me and you, we might be in, the, in, a, in a dance club thinking, oh, swimming pools, I love this track, mm. and just vibing to it and enjoying it. Mm. But somebody else who might be have family members who are suffering from alcoholism, they're able to go, oh shit, yeah. Lamar's talking about a, a subject matter that I relate to. Yeah. So you, you go much deeper with your lyrical content. The guy's been doing that since his, maybe before his early yeah. 20s. Yeah, so I remember that. He had that song with the saxophone. I can't remember the name of it, but it's just like heavy, you know, up front riff. Almost, and he's play, rapping, almost playing alongside the sax. Like, oh yeah, do you remember yeah, this for free? Shoot? Yeah, that's yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I, I wrote about, crazy. yeah, yeah. S studied that as well. There's some some scholars have written about that about how it's, um, it is a. Sometimes it's significant. You know, there's there's a there's an idea that all rappers should be really technically gifted, and and when they move over a rhythm, you got to be strict hit every beat you know mm. every syllable has to be meticulous mm. but there's there's much more like you look at artists like Kendrick Lamar who's mm. opened the door for this again but then you got artists like Mike sometimes Navy Blue uh, there's there's a bunch of them Marvy uh, there's others and and at times they will it's almost a deliberate thing that they'll non-align with the beat they'll mm. kind of go out of flow of the beat mm. and sometimes 
you know, people have to start realizing that that isn't a, a, side, a sign that those MCs are whack. Mm. Like it isn't a sign that they're not technically <clears throat> adept. What they're doing is they are putting, they are putting feelings mm. and that I, ideas and emotions over technical ability. Mm. You know, so so that so sometimes when you say something that's so important to you, you might go out of pocket. Mm. You know, the, the emotion might be there, but you might be out of pocket. And that is being embraced more and more by the younger generations. That mm. idea that they no longer want to justify that they can rap by being really technically adherent and being able to spit like a robot. It's mm. not about that anymore. It's, it's about finding these, like, holistic or these, these, like almost hallucinogenic loop patterns that they're rhyming in. Mm. And then they just sit over a, over a beat that evokes an emotion, but they're mm. not following that beat. To me, I, 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 it takes me a long time to work out what they're doing. Mm, mm, mm. So, you know, there's, yeah. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, flow, some, you know, when I hear people like Pav, big up foreign beggars, you know, Pav, mm. and he, he lays on that beat something crazy. To the point where it's like, dude, it's so it, what he's doing is so f frantic, but yet so laid back mm. vocally. Um, big up Sonny Jim as well, because he's another one that just really just you know he's um, you know he's, uh, he got that black exploitation air about his bars, and he's oh, you know yeah. he's really just delivering those one liners each time. Ding 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 ding. Yeah. Then then there's the whole flip side. Dirty South. And like you said, the new generation at the moment, it almost sometimes, the way they rap is almost like in front of the beat. Yeah, almost yeah. Almost like it's the way oh, it doesn't feel yeah, quite correct. Yeah. And you're like, yeah. jarry, but what, yeah. I'm still trying to get my head around that. Yeah, yeah. What the, is that? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you're right. It, uh, just different flows for different generations. Uh, yeah, I think since the, since the internet age, that's, that's come in, almost hitting the beat early, and then people start to find... That, that that's an you know all of a sudden there's a there's a generation who think well that's completely whack that's out of that's out of time but then there's a the newer generation of thinking that's how I want to put bars in now yeah. you know almost as if your acapella has been put a little bit shifted it's ever over so slightly the beat. Yeah, yeah yeah but then that's what I think is amazing it goes back to that lyrical performative quotation thing that the other generations new generations they don't necessarily want to be what we were. Mm. And that part part of that is a bit boring, mm. you know. It's it's when you think about it, you equate it to that idea that you don't want to do what your parents are doing. Mm. You want to if your parents are coming in really late on the beat and snapping like a diller, mm. you know, like that diller snap. You think, yeah, okay, that's fair enough. But I don't want to do what mm. my dad did or my mum mm -hmm. did. I'm gonna I'm coming in early. Yeah, yeah. I'm dropping in early. I'm gonna change the game. Yeah, and then and then you change the game. But but what? Just going back to to artists in particular like Mike, mm. and there are some artists from London that I've heard as well. You know, from England, who do this, but they are far more preoccupied with the poetics and the semantics within their vocabulary, their their delivery, mm. than whether they're rhyming. They're, they're rhyming heavily. Mm. Mm. An artist like Earl Sweatshirt is rhyming ridiculously, mm -hmm. but it's the semantics, it's the symbolics and the feelings within the words, the symbolism in, mm -hmm. in the words that count for a lot more than hitting the beat right, mm -hmm. you know? So there's a lot, m like I think the next generation is gonna be far more poetically minded, you know, feelings over technical adherence. That's what mm -hmm. I write about in one of the chapters is, it, you know, you can hear it happening, oh you know? Yeah. It's PhD, see? Yeah. Crazy. Um, as you were talking, um, and, and you know, phonetics, and you know, put, some MCs just inherently throw so many words into a, into a bar. Mm. Um, I remember when Company Flow came out. Mm. Now, this is a golden time. We, it was so informative for us, right? It's just, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah LP, yeah. Um, you know, he single handedly kind of presented coordinates of lyrical. Mm. Um, dexterity. Yeah, you know, his 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 performances on record were just like, dude, like, you know, you had to go and wait, get, go and get a dictionary. Just yeah, like, yeah. Felt like you were learning something yeah. every track, and um, and then that opened up, um, like MC, like virtuoso. Do you remember that MC virtuoso? No, I'm not sure. Dude, there was a whole bunch of you know, backpacker era kind right. of MCs that yeah. were really throwing science at it. Yeah. Then 
cool Keith came with Dr. Octagon, more mm -hmm. science. Yeah. What was your take on that for, at its time? You know what? I mean, I've uh, when it when it comes to all of that, in truth, um, I'm much more of a of a commercial listener. So you know, I, I followed those more commercial artists. So I, I you know I tried to listen for Company Flow. I think they were ahead of their time mm. to a point where it, I just wasn't ready. You weren't to ready hear for it, it at the time. Wow, yeah. Okay. But I but you know I know where you're making that link from what I'm talking about. Yeah. But uh, to to company flow and artists like that, it's, it's something that I need to go back and and do my homework on. But yeah, mm. I think you're right. That you know those were the pioneers of what I'm talking about. Mm. You know, not necessarily d uh, purposefully not doing what everybody else is doing. You mm. know, you you can even put Outcast in that. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, but so I, I was much more commercially minded for for most of my career. But it's you know it's now now I'm a little bit older that I'm starting mm -hmm. to realise you know the importance of those artists who are breaking the mould. I'm going to say something. And this is my musing. So I want your, I want your response to it. So mumble rap, mm. I love mm. in the same way I love um, thrash metal vocalists mm. because I don't necessarily need to hear what they're saying mm. yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. a feeling yeah it's a feeling yeah yeah there you go yeah yeah it's that it's that thing about you know music doesn't always have to you know always ha you should never have to always have to have a dictionary nearby yeah. like you might have to do that with my lyrics uh, sometimes yeah. you know like oh Capo's talking about something complex, okay. I don't really want to listen to that at the moment. I'm not. I, I'm not in the mood for that. I just want to hear somebody just put feelings over the beat. That's something I would yeah. love to be able to do. Yeah. Just put feelings over the beat. You know, different artists, different strokes for different folks. Different mm. artists for mm. different times in your life. Mm. Company flow for one time when you really want to think and you want mm. to have that f in the back of your mind. But then when you just want to let go and mm. just, just enjoy. Mm. Sometimes you, you want uh, an artist, say, like Playboy Carti. Yeah, yeah, you, exactly. You want to listen to that and just vibe out. All right, so on that note then, uh, you know, music for endurance. Uh, you're about to jump into a cold bath for three minutes. What three-minute song would you put on? Music for endurance. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, I think it's called You Don't Know by Jay-Z. It's what I've been listening okay. to recently. Yeah. Because going back to the beginning of this podcast, that idea that I haven't been able to write for a month or so, I know that my mind is starting to veer off into those dark areas. So, you know, what I'll do often is play the same song over and over in order to lift myself out of that. You know, yeah. for, for a certain time, whatever I'm doing, if I'm taking a journey or a walk or I'm traveling, I'll play that same song because it keeps me in that same place. Do you do, you, do, you do that? Do you ever repetitively play the same song yeah. or the same piece of music. Yeah, yeah I yeah. think a lot of people do. Yeah. You know, and as a shameless piece of promotion for my new album, mm. Canon, yeah. the initial track from that LP is called Pain. It mm -hmm. deals with yeah, yeah, yeah. that idea of how do, how do people uh, deal with pain as a concept, but also that idea of latent trauma, you know, uh, how, how, do you, how do you get yourself out of those clouds? Or when the, when the rain is falling in your life, metaphorically, how do you get yourself out of those clouds? One of the things that I've always managed to be able to do is just keep a headphone in, yeah. play the same song on repeat. It doesn't have to be like an uplifting track. It just needs to put me in, in the, the right place. That's my medicine. So you're literally injecting, injecting, you know, consistently for hours. So you're keeping yourself there. And I think people do it. And that's why... I think a lot of people do it if they're going to war. You know, oh. the people have these songs and they literally just have them on repeat and it acts as almost like a, a mental um, a drill, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. That's a cool thing to think about like that. Yeah. Maybe they do. I mean, I don't know. I've, I've got no evidence of that. But my, my evidence is myself. When I'm, when I'm in that bunker mentality, mm. when I'm up, kind of my back's against the wall, I'll put something on like Jay-Z's You Don't Know. Mm. You know, he says... What does he say in that song? It's, 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 it's like the epitome of that hustler mentality where, you know, when you, when, you've, when you have issues in your life, you will get through it, you will win regardless because you're a resilient person. He says, I want to get it right. But he said, um, I s what does he say? I sell ice in the winter, I sell fire in hell. I am a hustler, baby, I sell water to a well. 
I know, I know that that's not like the most complex line, but it just means a lot to me because mm. it's it's about that. Put me anywhere on God's green earth, I triple my worth. You know, yeah. whatever it takes, you will you will be that. You know what is what is needed. You you have what is required within you. Yeah. I like the thought of that. But just going back to my LP, the pain track. I tried to make that in in the guise of if somebody's going through that bunker mentality or they're feeling what I call out of alignment with mm. the world. You know, because we all do. We go yeah. through those moments when you're out of alignment with with the world, and for whatever reason, you, you sometimes it's it's impossible to get yourself back <coughs> on track. You just got to <coughs> wait it out. You know, and have faith that you will get back in alignment with the world. I made the pain track just in case somebody wanted to have something like that to use as their medicine. Mm. You know, for me, that's the biggest thing now. Mm. You know, get to a certain point in in your life, and it's about giving back as much as possible. Yeah, so, hundred percent. Yeah, you do all this studying. You you got this passion for this for this music, and then it's like, well, I, I have to give this to someone now. Mm. You know, somebody might benefit from what I know. So it's about it's about being able to sufficiently give back, you know, whatever I've I've got to give. Life is life is all about the many lives that you 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 have within it, and yeah, um, some songs just last the whole duration of your life. Yeah, the, um, but from a creative point of view, you know, some of the most hardest pieces of trauma, like you know, being on the motorway for three and a half hours, going to the Killer Keller podcast. You know, I jest. Uh, it's, um, you kind of need to go through them and putting that mm. across in music can often be tough. Um, I guess the point you're making is like, you know, to give, to, to give that, put that pain into a track or put that love into a track and it serves very much like, you know, um, swimming pools for Kendrick. Yeah. You know? so it's, mm. it's, it's, it's it's a real, um, <laughs> it's a it, it's a hard job, but someone's got to do it, right? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, and I, I assume that Kendrick Lamar from early on knew that he had a message, like he had, mm. he was a catalyst for an important message for the people around him first, and then for the world, and you know, it took me, like I was saying about other elements of my career, it takes. Sometimes it takes longer for people than others. It took me a long time to realize that I'm kind of like, I could be, I could be some type of catalyst for change for somebody else. Mm. I, I could be uh, a vessel for a message to deliver. So mm. you know, so when I get the chance, I want to be able to 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 do something like that mm. without it sounding too cliche or you know, too cheesy. You ever, you ever watch this program in, in England, particularly in the 90s, I remember watching it, football, grandstand, you know, match of the day, these yeah. sort of programs. Line them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's always this, there was this Scottish guy that always used to be on. And you didn't have to like football, but his passion for it. <laughs> you're just like, yeah, I've got to give it to the guy. If I, you know, he really loves this shit. Yeah, yeah. And I really hope this is resonating in the podcast because you, you're that guy. You're like, mm. you... Definitely got a passion for the art form, definitely. <laughs> Where does it come from? Where does that come from, Capo? I don't know, man. It's, it's just within. I think <coughs> in some ways, I think it just fell. It fell. I'm more than likely if I was from the 70s, it might have been progressive rock or something like that. Yeah. Or I don't know. And I think I, I just fell in that era. I think, you know, I, overall, I think I'm just obsessive over it. Mm. To a fault at sometimes, you know, it causes What's issues. What's the missus thing? Well, I mean, she must have always We seen. tend to, like, I, I, will, I will talk about, you know, elements of my career probably too much. She'd tell you too much. Mm. But in some ways, I try to keep that separate. You know, I try to keep my, my artistic life separate. I always have for some reason. Have because you? it's so close to me, I yeah. think. I don't like to feel... I don't know, but yeah, she would. I'm pretty certain that she would tell you that I talk about it too much. Really, you think? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Comment below, people. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this is why they love us, isn't it? You've got to have a, you've got to have a thing, isn't it? You know, something that really, you know, keeps you alive. Isn't yeah. It? Oh yeah, I think so. I, I was going to say something. Yeah, I like. I, I want to be as truthful as possible, and I know there's statistics out there about, you know, you hit a middle age, 
especially men, you hit a middle age. And I think, you know what you're saying about the idea that it's important to have a passion? Because I think you hit a middle age as a man and you start to realise, you know, Hemingway talks about this. You start, you, you're walking down the street, not that this was ever me, I was never this person, but you start to realise you get into a certain point where the maybe the females or whoever you're interested in, they don't look at you anymore mm. because you're of an age where you're out of that remit now. Mm. And then and then what do you hold on to? Do you know mm. what I mean? I'm not just saying life is all about that, relationships and uh, uh, attractions, but yeah. what I'm saying is you get to a certain age, your kids get old enough that they don't necessarily need you too much. What do you have? Like you, you And I think it's important to have this passion. I think for me... It's huge for me to have that passion, mm. something that I can back into when I've got that bunker mentality, when I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, what have I got, what have I got ahead of me that, and what's behind me? Sometimes it's overwhelming to think mm, like that. Yeah. I get that. And I'm not just... I, I'm talking from a masculine perspective. I'm talking yeah. from a male perspective because that's all I know. Yeah. But, I, you know, I, I think females of, of our age group, more than, you know, women of our age group, they probably feel the same. But... I know there's there's high statistics, you know, suicide rates mm -hmm. in, in men of this age. Mm -hmm. And maybe a part of that, the way that I see it, is is due to that idea that, you know, the, those those passions aren't there. They're not nurtured, perhaps. You don't feel like you got that passion. Whereas maybe for us, we're lucky because we have a passion that I know, mm. I know that whether I make money or not off this passion, if I go to the outhouse and I write to a beat, that's correct for me. I'm going to resonate with it, and it's going to help my heart. It's going to it help feeds my back soul. Into it. It's feedback. It's feedback. Yeah, I, I spoke to somebody who was a. This was a number of years ago, but they were a practitioner, a dance practitioner. I don't think they studied hip hop as an art form, but they were. They were from. I think it was the Arts Council England. So, mm. uh, you know, an organisation like that, mm. and obviously they were part of the governing body, so they had this upfront. You know, this kind of a stiff mm. demeanour. But afterwards, I was I was saying to them, you know, I, I understand that you, you your job comes first nowadays, like mm -hmm. a lot of people's does. You know, finances come first, family comes first, and all that. But I was like, what about your passion? And she said, look, at the, I, I was telling her I was worried about my passion. Like, I don't know, can I put a PhD first and foremost, or can I put, uh, you know, an academic job first and foremost, say? ahead of my music. What's going to happen to my music? So yeah. I was panicking. But she said, you know, she gave me that advice that I was trying to pass on. Then she was like saying, you know, most days after all of the the organisational, the, the, the regimented elements of her professional life mm. are done, that's when she heads to the studio and that's when she still cultivates that passion. That's how she refreshes and renews mm. every day. And identifying that. And then, and then realizing that, you know, that is going to be consistent in your life. Nobody can take that away. You know, mm. a lot of people say that about music. You know, you can, you can choose your family. You, you, you can't choose your family. Perhaps you can choose your friends, but, you know, you, you can get hurt in many different ways with being a human being. But one thing that I can rely on is music. You know, that's mm. always got my back. Like, no matter what, I can always find something I can rely on. Yeah, you're right. Um, and not a lot of people have that. Uh, yeah, um, or maybe they do, but they just haven't identified it. Identified and yeah. it, yes. And I'm saying that to, to middle-aged men. I think identify, it doesn't have to be music. And your no. passion can be anything. Yeah, yeah. But to get you out of that trench, or whatever you want to call it metaphorically, to get you out of that area where you're out of alignment mm. and, the, and, you know, there's whatever's going on in mm. your life. For, for everybody, it's different. But I think a lot of people will understand that place. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people have been down that road. To have something where you can... Zoom in. And, and, and do it religiously, like mm. almost piously adhere to that, to that practice. You know, give yourself, give yourself to that practice. Live it, that allows you to live in the moment, a level of stoicism. Oh, being in the present, man. Yeah. yeah, being in the present. I, I love that idea. Yeah. Being in the present as much as possible. Do you think we are in the present now? 100%. We're right here, right yeah. now. Yeah. It's stoic. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's what you're. That's what you're really. I think you're very much all about that, Capo. I, yeah. I, I feel like you're you're in the present with a high level of stoicism, a sense of zen. Yeah, you mm. your your dial must be pretty much on the floor in presence when you're writing. I, and I, I would imagine 
getting you out of that is 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 probably a tough call for you. Mm, yeah, I think so. I would say being in the present is like when I watch my son play football, I imagine him to be completely in the present. You know when there's you're in a competitive environment mm. and all you have to think about is that one thing. Mm. I think that's in the present. Maybe for me and you it would be performing on stage. Mm. You know, there's an expectancy of you mm. and then you're in the present. You're only thinking about mm. doing the best you can with, with the craft that you've, you've trained yourself in. Yeah. I think that's when you're really in, entirely in the present. And, and you know, you, you said it, the more you can be in that present, mm. the more the future, the past doesn't, doesn't, have, doesn't have any weight anymore. You yeah, know, yeah, you're yeah, living yeah. in that moment. When you're in, the, when you're in that moment, I, you know what I, <laughs> you know I visualise you in... I visualise your head moving like. I I kind of... Yeah, yeah, I, I'm going deep on this one. You know when kids, people, do Rubik's Cube really fast? Right, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a... a that's a equ mental equivocal of your head when you're... <laughs> When you're f no, flipping I words, I wouldn't say that. I, I've, I'm trash at, at Ruby's really? cubes. I can't. No, but I mean, like in a mental, you know, like I think of a sandstorm when you know when I hear Harry Shotter just barring off. Right. It's yeah, just like yeah. intense, intense. Right. For okay. you, it's That's almost a sick image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a Rubik's cube. You is like click, click, unlock, 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 unlock. Click, that's, click. Yeah. That's yeah. I would. I I like that image to represent me. Yeah. But I don't think that's the true me. I think you don't think so. No. I, I see it like that. Yeah. Really, I'm glad you do. I, I I like the I like the fact that hopefully my lyrics have portrayed that. You know, I've projected that image to you of being this. Yes. You know this almost superhuman cerebral. Click, 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 thinking, click, click. Yeah, 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 but it's. So it, what do you it, say? Okay, so what's your what's if if you were to have a, a, a an avatar, you know, what's your what is what is the capo avatar? Xavier. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they got the same. Uh, who else would it be? Yeah, Yul Brynner. Okay. Anybody with the same haircut as me? Yeah, yeah. You know? But yeah, um, yeah, Xavier, and that that goes back to that idea of being you know, complex with the lyricism, things like that, mm -hmm. you know, complex with, with the terminology and needing a dictionary when you listen to Capo. Mm. It's not, the, it's not mm. the coolest thing to be, but, you know, I rely on it now. You know, I've found in, in recent years reading a book right, right close. If I have the time, if I read something, then I it almost sometimes, it, a lot of the time, it will translate into the lyrics that I, mm. that I write. So... I'm working, so yeah, I mean, thinking about canon, there's a lot of like literary references in there. So there's a there's a track called Light Switch on the first chapter. So canon comes in three chapters. That's right, yeah. So it's got the first one, it, and it speaks of this journey that, that, I've, that I've been elaborating on a little bit. But that idea that the first chapter is a kind of an EP's worth of an idea of a, of a person articulating what pain is to them mm. and the idea of latent trauma and how they're dealing with that uh, in, in different, in different, from different angles or perspectives. And then you, then you come to the second chapter, which is all about that idea of using an art form or a process as, as, an, as a form of escapism mm. from that pain or that mm. latent trauma that you're dealing with. And then finally, the third chapter is, 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 is is uh, a representation of when a person resolves and and understands that and you know is conscious of the fact and, and aware that mm. those things might nece not necessarily go away, but you you're you're coming to you're coming to terms mm. with them. You know you're learning to mature to understand that the pain is a pain is a constant, but it doesn't define you. Mm. You know that idea. But yeah, uh, so a lot of I, I, I lean on a lot of literature in in the lyrics. So so that leads back to a song like Light Switch. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk about Ishmael Reed um, and his text. They're all allusions, you know. That I just make references to them in the hopes that anybody who has who has read or or knows about Ishmael Reed, they'll make that link and mm -hmm. go, okay. And I think. I'll, and then, and then maybe I will link it with Jean Reese and a text like Voyage in the Dark, and th but then I might link you know that up with with Hemingway again, you know. Mm. But I think it's art. A lot of art, whether it's whether it's uh, painted or written or performed, vocalized, I think a lot of it is like calling out to to for somebody else to go. 
I feel that. Mm. Like I, I completely understand where you're coming from mm. with that. You know, so yeah, a lot of a lot of my bars are sometimes they 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 lean on proverb quite a lot. You know, mm. um, I can't think of a proverb, but you know, like into each life some rain must fall. You know, I say that I say that early on in in the in the pain chapter mm. because it it it's it's a long term way that many people in the human race have articulated that sign that's that element of life which is you know into each life everybody's going to feel some rain you, mm. not every nobody mm. is going to get through in in all the sunshine you yeah. know even if they tell you that yeah. they have experienced yeah. rainfall so into yeah. each life some rain was for it really summarizes it captures that whole element of that's the human that's why social experience. media that's why social media is so such a facade do you know what i mean because it only shows the sunshine Never shows the fucking rain. Yeah, the yeah. The depth in where you're going with this right now, bro. Like, you're an artisan right now. You're, do you know what I mean? Like, the, these are real deeper than deep. You each, you break down each line by line and the yeah. influences. Yeah. You know? I, I want to do that more. Um, breaking down lyrics, I think, is in, is important for me now because... To the word, to the syllable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would love to do it at that granular detail. So, in in relation to Canon, it's the first project, you know, um, speaking of artisans, mm. I have to shout out Kong the artisan, you know, mm. the producer yeah, of on, Canon. Oh, yeah, on, so a long-term, a long-term friend of yours, an affiliate, you mm. know, musical yeah. affiliate. Uh, so you guys go go back way longer than me, but... I, you know, I have to shout him out because he is one of the people who was, he, he was the one who encouraged me to have that side of myself where it's like, look, embrace the fact that you've worked hard at this show yeah. and then show people the value in what you do. Yeah. Like, I, it's a painstaking process for me. I don't just throw these things out. Like no, the, to package it is a, yeah. It's a, to put, put yeah. everything together, to put the, to put the lyrics, to, to, to try and combine illusions and, or over over literary techniques into into the into the work and sometimes you know to find out what I'm doing you know mm. to find out about yourself it's it's a long process for me and I think it's valid now I feel like I want it to be valid that I can break it down a little bit more you know if I if I put a put a verse out there then maybe later on I will I will break it down like I will put it into context about what it what it truly means and and what it's engaging with you know uh technically and that seems to have helped mm. you know the promotion with canon on social media when i've broken it down like um i've got a artist called lee scott on mm. on a track yeah. called badlands right. which which is the the last track on the escapism element of okay. the album okay we'll look forward to that Go yeah on. so the, the, you know the the first chapter is out now and hopefully when people get to hear this podcast, all of the chapters will be out on DSPs, you know, mm. on, on streaming mm. platforms by then. So you'll be able to go and listen. But if you I'm I'm planning on continuing with my social media, um, especially on Instagram, I plan on continuing trying to break down the verses, you mm. know, trying to have some critical analysis going on of, of what I'm trying to do mm. because if I don't do it nobody's going to mm -hmm. like I, I've got to sometimes you have to champion your own work even mm. I'm a big advocate of putting art out there and letting other people decide whether it's good mm. but at this moment in time I, I I I need to be able to take get a grasp of music as a business too mm. and you have to be able to promote yourself mm. you have to be able to talk about yourself and value your work mm. so whereas in the past many many Releases have gone by where I put my heart and soul into it. I genuinely put my heart and soul into it. I can honestly say that. But I, but then after I've released it, I don't talk about it. You know, mm. it's 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 done for me. My part of it is done. Mm. Let other people perhaps die. Swan be a swan. Let it go. Yeah. yeah. So in 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 so much as that, I think that's fair, and I would like to be able to do that. But if I want to try and create this legacy, and I want to try and solidify that legacy. Perhaps it's down to me to really show what I'm doing in mm. some of the verses. So for something like Badlands with Lee Scott, recently I put up a few comments, you know, like a mini essay, say, mm. of what I'm doing mm. in the verse, you know, mm. it's to just to show the depth, to, mm. to, to prove the depth <laughs> in the work, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, to have you on a podcast, I mean, it's, it's gone forever. I, I just... 
ebbs and flows in in how you think and yeah it's just too much bro it's too thank you're you, too man. much my guy thank it's you very much for giving me the opportunity of speaking honestly, about myself i love I, I i've been a fan from the jump and you know this won't be the last um and the future is bright isn't it yeah i mean that's another thing that i really want to emphasize um i'm really happy with the way that this interview has gone because i think there's nothing wrong with with being nostalgic and and looking upon a person's past mm. and you know celebrating that, I think that's amazing. Mm. But for me, I feel like this. I feel like the, another part of my career is just beginning. Is, where yeah. I found myself, I'm able to objectify my music. I'm able to then speak about it in full. I want to mm. elaborate on these concepts and these topics that we talk about. I want to shine a light on other artists and on how they've influenced me. You know, I want to. I just want to be more verbal in, in my career. And I feel like, you know what is good inside is, yeah, I've been away studying a PhD. I, I've done a lot of learning involved in that. But now I feel like I'm back and I want to be prolific and I want to work and collaborate and I want to inspire further. And I feel like I've got that energy and that mm. hunger to do it, mm. you know. So reaching this age is is a is a point for some uh, artists, they'll... they'll They'll make it clear that you you reach a certain age like this as a rap artist, then what are you still doing rapping? You should be an entrepreneur now investing in stocks and shares. You know, a lot mm. of big artists, they talk like that. Case in point is... Uh, 50 art, Cent, maybe. 50, yeah, 50 Cent, but also a, a, a recent case in point is Andre 3000 talking about, uh -huh. you know, it's like, I'm a grown... I, f I can't say the, the exact quote, but I think he's... he's something around the lines of, look, I'm a grown man. What am I going to talk about as a mm, rap artist? Mm. I think he has a lot to talk about. Mm. Like, we all do. Mm. As artists, we, we grow. Yeah. You don't just stop because yeah. it's an art form like rap music. Yeah. Look at Black Thor. Yeah. Oh, the person man. like that is going to go on for forever, man. Like, Only in this podcast can we say these dons so on the money. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. What would he... What would the culture have done if he hadn't delivered yeah yeah the age yeah, he's at so now. many times yeah. yeah but you know he's a representative of somebody who i deem i i, I don't know what his age yeah, is yeah, but yeah. i deem him a generation before me yeah, yeah yeah but this guy's still a beast still hungry higher echelon i i would assume yeah a higher echelon and i would assume he has something within him that is innate like he has yeah. to write yeah it's an obligation and i'm not and i'm not and i'm not demeaning andre 3000's perspective because i get that too but i'm just saying i'm from that field or I'm from that place where it's it's required in me, it's needed. And I feel like going forward, hopefully, you know, me and Kong the Artisan have talked about the sequel to Canon and and taking what we've created as this platform and just moving it forward. And I'm excited mm. about yeah. the idea of working with live musicians, working yeah. with more collaborations, yeah. you know, thinking about melodies and song mm. form as well as just trying to put 32, 36 bars in a row. Mm. It's more about, okay, what can I do now to move someone, you know, mm. to, to to change their perspective or, or their, their angle on life? What concepts am I now going to bring mm. in, in the, at this age? What can I speak upon? Mm. You know, the other thing we were saying earlier is about Lamar bringing all these characters into his mm. work. Can I? Can I do that? You know, what's what's to say, how, how could I speak in a, another cadence or another tone my whole career is about that 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 concept of keeping it real, that hip hop mentality. Keep it real. Speak about where you're from. Be exact with your accent. All mm. of that. What about if there's a way that I could I could write something completely different in a, yeah, as yeah. a concept? I can, album? Add, I can add value to that one and say Prince. Yeah, yeah. Because he had a way. Of yeah. Feminizing. Feminizing. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, he had a valid. character. Yeah, he had a yeah. character, didn't he? That and he pitched the. Vo Vocal up. I'd, I'd say Andre did that as well. Yeah. On, on the more, below. I think the greats are the greats they can. They just do, so yeah. Feminising. Yeah, I, I need to start to learn to feminise. Like, but I would find it difficult to speak from a female perspective. Yeah. You know, I think you could get away with it if you're talking about a character, but even then it becomes problematic if you're a man trying to speak from a, from a woman's perspective. Mm. But, you know, on the, on the other hand, if I... If I if I was to hear somebody like Little Sim speak from a male perspective, I think it's valid. I yeah. think I would respect that angle. I would yeah. respect, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear because it gives you that insight. Mm. You know, it gives you what, what are your expectations of, mm. what, what does a, 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 
a woman, uh, when they when they embody a man, what do they speak about? What are the first things they think about? Mm. It gives you that what they preconceive as being the male experience, mm. and I'm I'm all for that. You know, mm. I, I I I think now I'm older. It's about pushing boundaries. It's about you know letting people live and allowing yeah. things, allowing people to 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 say what as long as they're not hurting anybody and, and extending your, your one's dynamism. You know, yeah. that, that what. Where can where can that feminine side go? Where mm. can that male side take? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Really opens the really opens the drawers out of like yeah. how you are. Yeah, we are as great yeah. people. Yeah, I yeah. think so, man. I, you know, there's there's many. The greats can do that. Yeah. The greats can take on characters, vulnerability. Yeah, the greats can show their vulnerability and help others. Yeah, you know. So that's something that I want to take forward. But just working with other people and still being inspired by mm. by younger generations, you know, and it's good that you you talked about mumble rap in that way. I don't even know the term mumble rap. I think that's derogatory in some ways, Absolutely. isn't it? But it, it, but I know Absolutely. what you mean, and I, and it's used all the time now. And I it, wonder... but I, and but I threw it out there intentionally. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah. No, Be I know what because, you mean because it's such a passe flippant thing to you know fucking tarnish a generation do you yeah. know what I mean um but but y taking reference to thrash metal and that guttural yeah yeah, yeah. oiness no, about that. you know that yeah I've never heard that I've never heard somebody make those similarities yeah. but I think it's true I think it exists mainly in in uh English um lap, uh, rap American using the English... Because when I hear a German MC uh, or an Italian MC, I ain't li you ain't checking for lyrics like yeah, that. Yeah. You're listening to it. It's like Coltrane. Yeah. It's yeah, like yeah. Miles Davis. It's different. It's yeah, like, li their, their voice is an instrument then, isn't it? Because yeah. you can't understand what they're saying. Yeah, so when people talk on that mumble rap shit, it's like, fuck that. It's like, an instrument. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, yeah. You know, we're really checking for it like that and it's yeah. important or else we're not, we're not thinking universally. Yeah. We're not thinking outside the box, right? Yeah, that's right. I think, yeah, that's one of the main issues. I, I never want to be stuck like that, yeah. you know, hating on newer generations and there's, I, I respect the purists too. I respect people who, you know, they have a lot of care for tradition and how things should be done. I get mm. that. But I also want to let younger generations live, like let them live, let them be what mm. they need to be. Because otherwise, how are you gonna, mm. how's anything gonna progress? You know. Oh yeah, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, reversing words and stuff like that. You know, who knows what the future will bring us? Mm. You know. Yeah. Well, my brother, it's in safe hands with Capo. That's for sure. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, man. No, thank you, Keller. Thank Ooh, you for letting real me talk speak. right here. And if that doesn't inspire you, you have been. You, I don't know where you are in the world. Do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter whether it's emceeing or any element of the creative arts. Just get in and dial in and zen. Go in. Killer Keller podcast. Out like in was out of fashion. Capo's here. Um, listen, stay lucky, people. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Crime don't pay and neither do they. So keep on doing what you're doing, all right? Be lucky. Peace. Peace. <laughs>